Hi, I'm Tony from the Cold Case Project. I'd never heard of Jill Dando before. As an American, I wasn't familiar with her story. But when I saw the BBC had released a documentary about her, I decided to check it out. What I learned shocked me. It was mind-blowing that this tragic case was still unsolved. So I decided to dive in, to get to know who Jill Dando was and why her story needed to be told. Let's go back to her early life. Jill Wendy Dando was born on November 9, 1961, in Weston, England. Her parents, Jack and Jean, raised her alongside her older brother, Nigel, who was also a journalist. Jill had a rough start. When she was only three, doctors found a hole in her heart and a blocked pulmonary artery. She underwent surgery in 1965, but her resilience was evident even back then, and she made a good recovery. That strength of spirit followed her through her life. Jill always had a dream, to be on TV. She wanted to work in television, to reach people and tell stories. She attended schools like Greenwood Junior School, Broad Oak Comprehensive, and eventually Weston College, where she was head girl, basically the equivalent of a student body president. From there, she went to Cardiff to study journalism at the South Glamorgan Institute of Higher Education. In 1985, Jill got her first job as a trainee reporter at a local newspaper called the Weston Mercury. That's where her journey really began. She quickly moved on to work as a newsreader for BBC Radio Devon and then as a presenter for the regional news magazine program Spotlight Southwest. By 1988, she was presenting national television news in London, making a name for herself. Her career took off from there. Over the years, she appeared on BBC's Breakfast News, the BBC One O'Clock News, the Six O'Clock News, and eventually became one of the hosts of Crime Watch, a show dedicated to solving Britain's most puzzling crimes. Jill's personality shone through on every broadcast, she was described as personable, well put together, and genuinely kind. People loved her. Jill's love life had its twists and turns. She dated a man named Bob Wheaton, a BBC executive, but they eventually split up in 1996. In 1997, she met Alan Farthing, a gynecologist, through a blind date. He was going through a divorce, but once that was finalized, Jill and Alan announced their engagement. They were set to marry on September 25, 1999. At this point, Jill's career was thriving. On April 25, 1999, she hosted the first episode of a show called Antique Inspectors, where collectors and hunters search for hidden treasures across the UK. She was scheduled to host the 6 o'clock news the next day and even had plans to host the British Academy Television Awards on May 9th. She was living her dream with the success, the luxury, and the respect of her audience. But she remained down to earth, never letting fame get to her head. But on April 26, 1999, everything changed. Jill had spent the night at Alan's house, and although she mostly lived with him, she had another property she was in the process of selling. That morning, she decided to go to her house for some reason, maybe to check on it or gather some belongings. At 11.32 a.m., Jill approached her front door. She was just about to enter when a figure appeared behind her, and in a flash, she was held down and forced to the ground. The attacker put a gun to her head and fired. The shot was so close to her that it barely made a sound, muffled by the impact itself. Her body lay there unnoticed for 15 minutes. Eventually, a neighbor discovered her and called the police. The call was heartbreaking. Jill was struggling for breath, and blood was seeping from her head. But by the time paramedics got her to Charing Cross Hospital, it was too late. Jill Dando was pronounced dead on arrival. She was only 37 years old. The news of Jill's murder stunned everyone. At first, the police even thought she might have been stabbed because there was so much blood and no one had heard a gunshot. Her death rocked the BBC community, her family, friends, and her audience. This wasn't just a news headline. It was the brutal murder of someone millions of people felt connected to, someone who felt like a friend through the screen. 
The press went into overdrive, fueled by speculation and the endless desire to find out who could have done this. Why would anyone want to kill Jill? She didn't have enemies, at least none anyone knew about. Was it an obsessed fan? A jealous rival? Or maybe a grudge from one of her old cases on Crime Watch? The Metropolitan Police launched Operation Oxborough to find Jill's killer. They interviewed 2,500 people and took over 1,000 witness statements in the first six months alone, but none of it brought them closer to a suspect. Speculation was rampant. Could it have been a criminal from one of her Crime Watch episodes who harbored resentment against her? Or a fan whose obsession turned deadly? One theory gained traction, that it might have been retaliation. Just days before Jill's murder, NATO had bombed the radio television of Serbia's headquarters, killing Serbia's leading journalist, a figure many compared to Jill. Could this have been Serbia's payback? But the investigation eventually ruled out this theory, finding little to connect Jill's murder to any international conflict. At the scene, investigators found limited evidence. There was a bullet casing with tiny indentations near the top, suggesting that the gun may have been tampered with, possibly to reduce the noise of the shot. Jill's killer had clearly planned meticulously to avoid detection. One neighbor did hear a scream, but it sounded like an excited shout, like Jill greeting someone she knew. Months passed without any solid leads. The media and public grew increasingly impatient, demanding answers. Jill's family wanted to understand the motive, the why behind such a senseless act. Then, police stumbled upon a tip they had overlooked, a man named Barry George, who had a troubled past and a long history of disturbing behavior toward women. Barry lived near Jill's home and had a criminal record that included impersonating a police officer as well as stalking behavior. When police searched Barry's home, they found a collection of undeveloped film roles, which, when developed, revealed numerous photos of random women and a disturbing image of Barry posing in a face mask with a weapon. He had notes on people's license plate numbers and maps to various women's homes, including several cutout photos of Jill herself. Though circumstantial, this evidence made Barry a prime suspect. They also discovered a coat with a small trace of gunshot residue in the pocket, chemically similar to residue found on Jill's body. Based on this evidence, police arrested Barry and charged him with Jill's murder. In July 2001, Barry was convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment. Yet, many doubted the strength of the case. The gunshot residue could have been transferred in countless innocent ways, and as the public learned more, it became clear that Barry's mental limitations might have made him incapable of committing such a calculated crime. After several appeals, Barry's conviction was overturned, and he was eventually acquitted. This left the case wide open, and Jill's family along with the public, were once again left with no answers. More recently, an anonymous hitman claimed to know who killed Jill, igniting public interest once more. Although investigators have reopened the case with this new information, the leads have yet to bear fruit. Jill's loved ones remain desperate for closure, hoping for clarity on why she was taken from them so suddenly. Whether the attack was due to her fame or simply a tragic coincidence, Jill Dando's murder stands as a haunting reminder of how life can change in an instant. Her death left an irreplaceable void in British journalism and in the lives of everyone who knew and loved her. Thanks for watching, everyone. This case is filled with so many twists and turns, and even after all these years, Jill Dando's murder remains a deeply disturbing mystery. Was she targeted because of her work, or was it an unfortunate random act? Let me know your theories in the comments below. I'd love to hear what you think. If you found this story compelling, please hit the like button, share this video, and don't forget to subscribe for more true crime stories. I cover the cases of people who have vanished or whose lives ended in tragic mystery, and I'm dedicated to keeping their stories alive. Turn on notifications so you never miss a new upload. Until next time, stay safe. Stay curious, and remember to keep seeking the truth. See you in the next video. In the chill of a North Carolina winter night on January 2nd, 
2000, Zeb Wayne Quinn, an 18-year-old with a warm smile and a kind heart, vanished without a trace, leaving behind a case that has haunted Asheville for over two decades. Zeb was just beginning to step into adulthood, working diligently at the local Walmart, and saving up for the dreams he held close to his heart. He was described by those who knew him as a polite and reserved young man, very close to his mother, Denise, and sister, with whom he shared his day-to-day -day thoughts and plans. Having spent months saving, Zeb was looking forward to buying a car of his own. But fate, or perhaps something far more sinister, would intervene. The day of his disappearance started like any other. Zeb was scheduled to work a shift at Walmart and planned to meet up afterward with a co-worker named Robert Jason Owens. Owens was someone Zeb trusted enough to make a quick trip to look at a Mitsubishi Eclipse that he was interested in purchasing. This seemingly mundane outing would turn out to be Zeb's last, and Owens would be the last known person to see him alive. After their shifts ended around 9 p.m., Zeb and Owens drove separately, heading to the dealership together. Surveillance footage captured them stopping at a gas station just outside of town to buy sodas, a snapshot of normalcy. From there, the two continued driving. But soon after leaving, Owens claimed that Zeb received a page that appeared to shake him. In Owens' account, Zeb pulled over to the side of the road, visibly distressed, and told Owens he needed to make a phone call right away. After speaking briefly on the phone, Zeb returned to his car, his demeanor significantly changed. According to Owens, Zeb then told him he had to cancel their plans and abruptly drove off. That was the last confirmed sighting of Zeb. When he failed to show up at his job at Walmart the following day, his family immediately knew something was wrong. Zeb was known for his reliability, and missing work without a word was completely out of character. His mother filed a missing persons report, initiating an investigation that quickly deepened into a chilling mystery. Two days later, Zeb's light blue Mazda protege was found parked near a local restaurant in Asheville. The location was far from the car dealership Zeb had intended to visit, a peculiar detail that made his family and police wonder what had led him to abandon his car there. But the strangeness didn't stop there. The car was found in an unusual condition, with several odd items scattered inside and on it. A pair of lips and an exclamation point were drawn in bright lipstick on the back windshield, an unsettling image that no one could quite explain. Inside the car, police discovered several items that did not belong to Zeb. A live Labrador mix puppy, a jacket, and a hotel key card. None of these items seemed to connect to Zeb, leaving investigators bewildered. The puppy, fortunately, was unharmed but seemed entirely out of place in the context of a missing person's case. Zeb's family was desperate for answers. The peculiar clues left in the car raised suspicions that someone might have staged the scene, either to send a cryptic message or to divert attention from what had truly happened. The presence of the puppy and the lipstick markings led to countless theories, each more baffling than the last. Investigators explored the idea that Zeb had somehow staged his own disappearance, but his family was certain he would never willingly leave them without a word. Attention quickly turned to Robert Jason Owens, the last person known to have seen Zeb. When questioned, Owens maintained that he had no idea what had happened to his friend. He stuck to his story. Zeb had received a page, made a call, seemed distressed, and sped off without further explanation. Owens' account was compelling enough, but investigators began to unearth contradictions. Owens had reported being involved in a car accident on the same night Zeb disappeared, and he had shown up at a hospital with injuries, including broken ribs and a head wound, claiming to have collided with a utility pole. However, officers found no record of this accident, no police report, and no evidence that such a collision had taken place in the area he described. Owen's injuries raised suspicions, with some wondering if they had occurred during an altercation with Zeb or another situation related to his disappearance. Further investigation into phone records provided additional troubling information. It was discovered that, just hours after Zeb was last seen, Owens had used his own phone to make several calls to Zeb's pager. It wasn't a simple accident. 
He had used the 69 feature to mask the origin of the calls, which pointed to a deliberate attempt to either reach or manipulate Zeb. This phone activity contradicted Owen's initial account and made investigators wonder if he had more knowledge of the events that night than he let on. But as odd as these clues were, none of them directly implicated Owen's and Zeb's disappearance, and the investigation grew cold. Zeb's family, however, refused to let go. Every anniversary of his disappearance brought renewed efforts from Denise, his mother, and his extended family, who continued to advocate for answers and spread awareness about his case. The unanswered questions weighed heavily on the small North Carolina town, a reminder of how someone could vanish without a trace. For 15 years, Zeb's disappearance remained an unsolved mystery, with no substantial developments until a horrifying new crime came to light. In 2015, Owens was arrested for the brutal murders of J.T. and Christy Codd, a couple from the Asheville area. The Codds, who had recently announced that they were expecting a child, were found murdered and dismembered in their home. Owens was soon implicated and later confessed to the killings, pleading guilty to second-degree murder. His violent actions shocked the community, and Zeb's case was thrust back into the public eye. Owens' connection to both Zeb's disappearance and the Cod murders led investigators to re-examine his role in the 2000 case. A search of Owens' property yielded several potentially incriminating items, including fragments of leather and fabric, but nothing conclusive could be linked to Zeb. Investigators continued to follow leads, but without more direct evidence, they were unable to connect Owens definitively to Zeb's disappearance. The community was left with an agonizing sense of incompletion, believing that Owens might have held the answers all along, yet with no proof to close the case. As the years passed, Zeb's family has continued to honor his memory, keeping hope alive even as the trail grew colder. His mother, Denise, became a relentless advocate, working tirelessly to keep her son's story in the public consciousness. She held out hope that, one day, someone might come forward with the truth or that a breakthrough might finally emerge. For her and for all who love Zeb, the lack of closure has been a torment, an open wound that can never fully heal. Today, over 20 years later, the name Zeb Quinn lingers as an unsolved mystery that hangs over Asheville, a town haunted by his absence. His story is a reminder of how lives can be shattered in an instant and how, even with advanced technology and relentless investigation, the truth can sometimes remain frustratingly out of reach. Zeb Quinn's disappearance has inspired numerous theories. Some believe he was a victim of foul play. Others suspect he may have been silenced over a hidden conflict or secret he discovered. Owens remains a shadowy figure in Zeb's story, his violent crimes casting a chilling light over his past involvement in the case. But until there is concrete evidence... The question surrounding that night in January 2000 will linger, a tragic mystery that may never be solved.